we can play it back later if anyone would like to see what's been discussed. So as, uh, as we've been, as I mentioned, and as the video has highlighted, the G20 finance ministers will be meeting in a couple of weeks time and they will be deciding on our money, uh, our jobs and our future, our lives. This is a crucial moment. If we're serious about building a just recovery, we need to see that people are going to shift the dial in terms of how business uh, and how the economy can be shifted. So we don't want business as usual. We want a just recovery. And this is a key moment to come together. We're so glad to be here with so many of you. Uh, and we're looking forward to a a very punchy lineup of speakers today as well who can bring a whole range of different perspectives from different parts of the world just to illustrate how we are facing this double uh, whammy of the COVID crisis with the climate crisis that was already underlying and the economic crisis that sits with that. So first of all, to kick us off, I'm hoping that we've got uh, Tamara Tolles Lochlin from 350 based in the US. Tamara, hoping you're there. Hi, how are you? Glad to be here. Great, over to you. Uh, wow, uh, it's a nice cold opening. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name's Tamara Tolls O'Loughlin and I have the pleasure of being the North America Director here at 350.org. Uh, just so you know, we always flag our pronouns here and mine's are she, her, hers. I'm calling you from among other places, uh, Piscataway Nation territory in Baltimore, Maryland. So just wanna flag that uh, there are many conversations we could have, but we'll talk about just recovery today. Um, it's really important for us to be in this global moment having a conversation about the compound crises that we're facing. Uh, it is um, a moment of racial injustice and climate change and a space where it is our duty to stand up for the commitment that ending anti-Black violence and dismantling systems of white supremacy uh, are the best work we could do to, to avoid the continued marginalization and destruction of the lives of Black people everywhere. Uh, the same communities that are battered by coronavirus are also long-term epicenters of over-policing, state-sanctioned violence, and murder. And all of it is coming to these communities already facing uh, down increasingly deadly climate disasters, uh, poisoned by toxic fuel extraction and pollution, pollution uh, facing long-term and uh, really incendiary anti-protest legislation that criminalizes the work of protesting your right not to be poisoned, and facing an unjust incarceration system that backs it up with voter suppression so that when you do step up to raise your voice, it isn't heard. So, in the context of our work in the US and Canada, we are in a moment where we are struck by how many trillions of dollars magically appear as resources to support a crumbling economy built on fossil fuels. Uh, we step in as folks who are here for a just recovery, looking for investments in a Green New Deal that phase out fossil fuels, but all of that has to be paired with a commitment to divest or defund systems of white supremacy that include the police that perpetuate racial injustice. The issues that I'm going to talk about in a little bit of detail here are the same. Black people are climate people. Uh, indigenous people are climate people. All people of color are climate people. It's time for us to recognize that there's a tremendous opportunity in the middle of these crises, and we have a responsibility to demand a just recovery that protects all workers, gives um, the money that we are, that is our common value to people who need it, that protects our democracy and prioritizes folks who have been injured, uh, not just today, but in ongoing fashion and by specific design of the system that we're in. Uh, my colleague uh, and executive director, May Bovey, will speak a little bit more about our just recovery principles, but just to give you a sense of how it really informs our work, I wanna talk about the fact that our vision for the future is thinking about uh, making fossil fuel co companies accountable for climate crisis. They are the same ones that have pillaged the ancestral lands of indigenous communities who've done so without informed consent. And as we take on our work to defend black lives, we call it climate for black lives in our space. We're also standing in solidarity with our brothers and sisters who have been working on missing and murdered indigenous women's movement for a good long time and thinking about how we can get to a demand for climate reparations that rebuilds, repairs, and redistributes resources at every level so that people come before profits. It is no doubt that if you're on this call, you are 
already clear that we're up against the wealthiest and most racist industry in the world when we're talking about going up against fossil fuels. In the last decade alone, the number of billion dollar climate disasters has doubled from the previous decade with 14 separate billion dollar disasters just in the last year. Companies like Exxon and Chevron and TC Energy and Enbridge continue to double down on extraction and deception. And more often than not, they're pushing for toxic fuel projects in black and indigenous communities. They turn our homes, our communities and our families into sacrifice zones where our health is, is given up over and over again. So business as usual can keep going. That's what makes it evil. It isn't just about making money. It's about deciding that human lives don't matter. Um, and thinking about the context of that we're in in this climate crisis and moment of uprising, it's not a far cry for us to call for divestment and defunding because the police in this context serve to protect the profits of the few and destroy the lives of the many to do so. The murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Marbury are recent reminders of an ongoing and systemic pattern of structures that devalue our lives over and over again. It starts from the moment we are conceived and show up in our mother's womb. We are given less of everything. We are pushed to fight for more of everything. We're not given access to resources and, and then are moved into communities designed to connect us to and expose us to toxic pollution that causes higher rates of asthma and respiratory disease and in general makes us more vulnerable to moments like COVID, which will become more uh, likely as pandemics increase in the climate crisis. There are 45 million workers in America losing their jobs while billionaires in the US make 584 billion off of the pandemic. So it's not really difficult to draw a line in the sand about who's keeping the economy running, who is willing to extract from our communities and profit off of our deaths and to, to um, continue to underscore the design to make more profit. So to pull this out a little bit because we're in a global conversation, the decisions that are going to be made at the G20 have the opportunity to put us on the right path at a crossroads to care and repair. Uh, cross regional investments in people and a just recovery from the compound crisis could steer us away from economic upheaval at the less, last chance we possibly have to work on climate breakdown. Pulling it back in towards the national level, Fossil fuel companies are key drivers of what does and doesn't get said at these kind of events. They're seeking to benefit from national stimulus packages, not to protect workers, but to prop up their debt cycles and the dangerous volatility of dead business. Coal, oil, and gas is digging up dead business and making it everyone else's problem as an indicator of economic viability, and that argument is false. While many of us were held up in our homes if we're lucky enough to have them in quarantine, Trump signed an executive order waiving environmental review of toxic projects like KXL, reinforcing the continuing link between white supremacy and dirty profits of the most polluting industry in the world. That's why it's important that we all get into this public conversation around calling out fossil fuel bailouts for what they are and resisting the urge to take a couple of dollars today as our economy, our culture, our community is made to decline. Uh, in the US, we've also been focusing on federal legislation, including the HERO and CARES Acts that get us closer to making the point that workers don't just appear, they're a part of communities. And if we focus on health, and community access and making sure people are put in the right in right relationship to the economy of the future by investments that are made in our interest and not in fossil fuels, we do the work of just recovery. Our job is to support collective demands across the board for divestment and defunding to make sure money and resources get to those who are impacted by the coronavirus, not by billionaires who can afford to have better access than we do. So in thinking through uh, what this looks like in my hometown in New York, we didn't arrive at this moment today. The movement work that you are seeing comes from a long, many decades of act activist work, activism work, global solidarity that showed up in movements demanding that we do what we can for Black lives. Because in July 17th, a, a few days from now, uh, in 2014, the same police force that, that caused us to move into this moment choked the life out of Eric Garner and started the first public iteration of I Can't Breathe, not because it wasn't happening in communities where we're starved to death, not giving resources and then exposed to toxic fuels and chemicals, but really thinking through that like this through line of I Can't Breathe is relevant in every context where we're talking about fossil fuel infrastructure, poor investments and sacrificing of communities. So to 
talk about places outside of my own hometown, I am happy to think about uh, the horrifying moment we're in around where, uh, Louisiana, where two white officers uh, murdered Alton Sterling or and in, in following in 2016, and then followed that up in 2018 by passing anti-process legislation. There is a real linkage between suppression of individuals, suppression of, of people under the power of the state, and making people subject to criminalization for defense of their own uh, humanity. So thinking through how those communities were at that time recovering from Hurricane Katrina and that devastation being put through the ringer as the system forms a line of blockade against it, that really helps us get into this current moment we're in where two members of the Louisiana Bucket Brigade were just um, uh, threatened with being thrown under the jail, as they say in my culture, by uh, for terrorizing people by uh, setting up a peaceful protest. So these are pretty clear examples of how fossil fuel groups um, profiting off of police militarization are criminalizing us as collateral damage, as continued sacrifice zones to line their oily pockets. So happy to have some conversation about that when we move uh, further through the conversation and the rest of the folks that are here. But I just want to say briefly before I step away that this isn't just happening in the US part of North America. In Canada, $15.1 billion a year of Canadian tax dollars are going to police services. That's $41 million every day. So when we talk about the scale of change and the scope of resources that we need to get to jobs, infrastructure, and human health, it turns out there's plenty of money to do evil. So we should be able to scale back a bunch of it to get um, the good work done that needs to be done for the future. Just this year, unfortunately, June 4th, Chantel Moore, an indigenous Canadian woman was shot and killed by Edmonton police who were called to perform a wellness check. They came into her home like Breonna Taylor to find out what's going on and ended up taking someone's life. This isn't an accident, it's built into the system. So when this conversation is happening uh, across uh, borders and across countries, we have to think about what it means to move into a just, re just recovery that responds to the crisis we're in uh, and puts us on a path to a Green New Deal for jobs, infrastructure, and human health. What is our response? How do we recover? How long do we have to focus on governments to do their job to rebuild? And that's what brings us to this moment of focusing on G20, because the folks who have to answer that question who set the stage for our resources and ability to move people and money to solve problems happen in rooms like this where we're not invited. So as we think about the examples I presented here and those that the other guests will um, speak to around how Black families, Indigenous communities, and all people of color are facing police violence, and they're also the same folks who are specifically targeted and zoned out of access and exposed to toxic fossil fuel projects. So when we're put in a space to separate out our issues and make it neat and tidy and to uh, avoid becoming emotional, it is our duty to demand that a just recovery means we have to look at all of it. We can't just pick the parts we want to and leave communities uh, to fend for themselves. And I'll see my time for the rest of the meeting. Thank you so much, Tamara. I mean, that is an incredibly powerful analysis that you've just given us um, of the intersecting nature of the crisis that we're facing and the different elements that are uh, overlapping in terms of that, uh, that, that kind of crisis that the whole world is facing. Um, I'm not sure if uh, people have seen in the, if we can just make sure Q&A goes to the Q&A box. Um, there's, a, there's a comment or two in the chat. So please do keep putting in your Q&A uh, ideas into the Q&A box. So this is a moment that we've really brought together a very broad range of different organizations. I mean, from our side, from, from the Action for Sustainable Development side, from the 350 side, we've combined forces and more than 1,200 organizations have now got behind this notion of a just recovery. So this is an urgent, urgent need that so many organizations are joining, 150 countries all over the world. Um, and we've seen a huge number of people signing up in terms of online petitions, in terms of tweets. And we'll, we'll talk to you in a little bit about some of the other actions that that you guys can take yourselves. Um, it may have been missed earlier on. I did do my pronouns as well, uh, he, him, and I'm half Brazilian, half British. And it, I'm really excited and delighted that we have a Brazilian colleague uh, to speak to us next to give us some insights on what's going on in Brazil, which breaks my heart to see uh, the situation there. So Claudio, over to you. Claudio. 
Claudio, can we hear you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Great, thank you, Tamara, for responding. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is a very complicated moment right now for the whole world, and particularly for uh, the countries in the Global South, and most specifically countries in the Global South that are being governed by people that tend to go against science, against common sense, against uh, solidarity in many ways. So the situation in Brazil is quite dire and following a little bit of what Tamara is saying is this, just like uh, we can reflect that on the reduction of budget for fighting poverty in Brazil and the escalation of budget for police enforcement. So instead of fighting poverty, you pick up some of that money and you just invest in the militarization of police. And I believe that it's completely connected to the fact that the industrial, financial, military complex that has been built since Second World War is alive and well, and it's showing all its strength. And the way that the wars of the 21st century were fought was using public resources to invest in very specific monopolized military companies to produce hardware so they could terrorize somewhere else. Once those wars were fought and over with good or bad or horrible results, all of this hardware and this research that was done by all of these private monopolies turned into the country itself. So then now the companies had this you know, pile of of uh, manufactured commodity, which were weapons and ammunition and all kinds of security apparatus, and they had to find a place to sell them. And that's how economy works, right? You have the supply and then you look for the demand. And in this case specifically, the demand comes with ideology because it, it comes with, uh, you know, prejudice. It comes with terrorizing fear in people. It comes, in, it comes with uh, concepts such as good and evil that uh, people tend to feed into their lives and to their neighborhoods. And so they can conceive and pre-visualize what would be good and what would be evil. And many times the people that, you know, based on their religion, religious beliefs, they do think that they are doing good, but in fact, they are doing a lot of evil because they can not get a very profitable uh, strategy for a company. So then in this case, for the military situation was, then you create this bubble of fear and then you create the bubble of security and then you create the bubble of private security in many ways. And the fact that wealth becomes in between quotes, sacred. So we could spend a lot of the public resources to defend the private wealth. And, you know, not care much about the fact that we need to actually share more of that wealth, reduce the inequalities, so violence would inevitably fall easily, as has been proven many, many times and, and in many places in the world. But I don't want to go further into this because one of the things actually for the just recovery would be, in my first point, would be let's slash the military budgets. Why do we need $750 billion a year for the CIA and the Pentagon to terrorize other people's lives? And they're not even competent on any of those things. What of money? An industry, Martin and other Boeing and other companies, other big American and, and European companies like Saab in Sweden, you know, uh, my connection is unstable. Okay, it's back. It feeds into the market, internal market in these places. So they militarize the police in such a way that then they become a lot more lethal. A governor of Rio de Janeiro was elected based on a campaign slogan that said, if you are a bad person, watch out because I can snipe you in the head. 
like snipers, you know what I mean? And based on that, after he was elected, actually, a 14-year-old black kid out of Vahosinha was murdered, sniped in the head. And he was carrying notebooks and books coming back from school. Another family father with his son and, and, and two cousins were completely obliterated by the army that was occupying Rio de Janeiro last year with 80 shots in a car and they were going to a baby shower, right? And then he comes back to the race thing and, and Tamara's uh, point is extremely uh, well taken because it is systemic and structural. So the second point is we need to dismantle the systemic structural ways of keeping inequality and prejudice alive. So tax systems, we need to talk about tax. And here I'm gonna quote uh, Rutger Bregman, the Dutch guy, the Dutch historian that said that uh, at the World Economic Forum, taxes, 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 we're done with philanthropy. Philanthropy is 0.1% of the amount of resources that they would contribute if they paid the proper taxes. That was one of the points. So yes, somebody asked, me, asked here in the Q&A, about how to reduce the number of billionaires. You have to tax, you have to put capital controls, you have to put regulations. But then when we come with these things that actually lots and lots of economists agree, they, the government economists go, oh no, this is distortionary of the market. Oh yeah, you can rig the market like the LIBOR, you know, the LIBOR uh, uh, rates in England that were rigged for more than 12 years. And that's not considered distor distortionary, but actually to apply a financial transaction tax where you could actually bring some of the liquidity to invest in very specific and urgent demands so you can reduce the inequality and eradicate poverty in everywhere, particularly in the most, uh, in the richest country in the world. Then they say, thank you, Wally. I'll then they say, oh, it's distortionary. We cannot do that because then people would flock the market. Yeah, they would flock the market and go where? There's nowhere to go. There's only one planet. There's no planet B, as Antonio Guterres likes to say. So the point is, we have to really regulate capital and we have to regulate with a democratic feeling. Like Dr. Cornel West says, you know, one of my heroes uh, currently, which is like, we have to bring the democracy that we founded in a way, at least in principles, and we believe that freedom and democracy and these very high values, we need to rescue them back. And we need to apply democratic governance. And to apply govern, uh, democratic governance is to regulate monopolies, is to contest things like Obrigado, Claudio. I think I think we're losing you. Thank you, Ali, and thanks for extending uh, the time. It was I was inspired by Tamara. <laughs> Muito obrigado. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just to recap, so Claudio from Gestas in Brazil, and also very active on the CSO Financing for Development Group, uh, and we've already been hearing there about some of the financing issues and on the call earlier today as well this question about ferro taxation and closing uh loopholes for uh the uh the, the the way that money is being diverted and siphoned off is so essential and critical to actually ensuring the money reaches the right places along with dropping the debt cancelling the debt and i hope we'll hear more on that uh, in just a minute so the next speaker that we have now is coming from Fridays for Future in Uganda, uh, Hilda Flavia Nakabuya, and it's a real pleasure. I heard Hilda earlier today, and it's uh, an inspiration to see people standing up all around the world. So Hilda, we look forward to hearing from you next. Hi. Yes, got you um, now. Okay, can, can everyone hear me now? Yes. 
Okay. Thank you for having me here again. Yes. Um, okay. I am, I am Hilda and I'm a climate activist from Uganda. I join the Global Climate Strikes every Friday to remind our leaders and corporate organizations that we need climate justice and the money we want and the jobs we want and the future we hope to live depend on the kind of lives that we live now. Climate change is a global problem and so is COVID-19. Both of them have no boundaries. They affect everyone regardless of their gender, color, status, age, and our actions to fight these crises will determine our future tomorrow. The pandemic has created a big economic shock. Its existence has meant taking very different decisions on the environment in a way that is very vital. And it's the new normal. This new normal with the activities we do need to continue even after COVID-19. Many people's attitudes are changing and this is the hope that we have that we can get a just recovery, that a new normal is possible. But however good our intentions as individuals are, it will take a lot more of determined moves by government and corporate organizations to make sustainable decisions that will help us build momentum towards global mobilization and actions around these global challenges in order to have a just recovery. Well, for the case of my country, Uganda, we were recently hit by floods as a result of changes in rainfall patterns that is attributed to climate change. Several settlements along Lake Victoria and other lakes and rivers in Uganda were washed away by floods, leading to several displacements of people, destruction of crops, and other properties, which included uh, infrastructure such as schools, roads, bridges, hospitals, and others. An estimated 173,000 people were affected by the floods, and this number is since May. So there are more than that uh, people who are affected because the floods are continuing. So these people are, first, are forced to relocate to temporary confinements for safety and making other climate refugees in other regions because these uh, temporary confinements are not enough for everyone. So such conditions of displacement and overcrowding in shelters will most definitely compromise the COVID-19 response measures of self-distancing or self-isolation. Furthermore, uh, floods are known to trigger outbreaks of waterborne diseases and malaria, which compounds the vulnerabilities of the communities to COVID-19, because these measures of self-distancing will be compromised. In response to COVID-19, the Uganda National Meteorological Authority's seasonal rainfall outlook says that these climate change effects are not about to stop. What does this mean? This means that floods will continue affecting the efforts to deal with COVID-19 due to the displacement of people and the destruction of infrastructure. And this same infrastructure includes hospitals where these people who are affected with COVID-19 are, are medicated from. So since such communities have to deal with both crises, building resilience against them is therefore crucial in order to save lives and livelihoods. But the question is, what can we do to achieve a just recovery? Many people's perception of the environment has changed. For instance, some people have resorted to walking, to cycling, staying at home during the lockdown. This has made more people, many people spend time in agriculture and nature, which is good for the environment in return. Well, due to unexpected consequences like lockdown uh, of industries, of transport networks and businesses brought due to COVID-19, it has brought a certain drop in carbon emissions which have, sharply, which have sharply fallen during the lockdown. 
Um, for instance, in China, emissions fell by 25% at the start of the year as people were instructed to stay at home. We can see that in other countries, there is clear water, clear air, and wild animals are moving. But on the other hand, the pandemic has also brought widespread job losses and threatened livelihoods of millions as businesses struggle to cope with the restrictions being put in place by government to control the virus. We can also see that economic activities have stalled. The other is it has made discussions around climate change more difficult as mass events are postponed. For instance, uh, such as the COP26, as well as the climate strikes or climate conferences, which are now online, just like this one. However, the massive disruption of our routines has caused, the massive disruption in our routines caused by the pandemic has come with an opportunity for us to move to a more sustainable lifestyle. But this lifestyle will only happen if our leaders are willing to take concrete and decisive steps to encourage positive environmental changes that are enacted during this lockdown. If we keep up the same lifestyle, the way of living, we are assured of a just recovery. Well, the measures to enhance climate resilience can be part of the COVID-19 responses. The same way those to contain and deal with the pandemic can be used to build community resilience to climate change impacts. The promotion of climate, um, the promotion of climate resilient practices as well will ensure food security and a just recovery as well as reduce our community's vulnerability in this time. Well, climate change is well known for bringing about disasters. What does that mean to us? That effective disaster management and preparedness is key in dealing with such crises. These times of COVID-19 of change during, these times of change uh, during this COVID-19 have led to the introduction of lasting habits, and most of them are good for the climate. That means that if we need to take action, we can. But the question is, why haven't we for climate change? We need real action and not just as usual talks. Well, um, I'll end with a quote from President Macron, where he said that people have come to understand that no one hesitates to make very profound or brutal choices when it's a matter of saving lives. It's the same for climate risk. It is the moment they have to be strong and bold to take radical steps to protect our environment. So if we want a just recovery, we have to stand up and fight for it. We have to remind and push our governments and leaders to make the right selfless and sustainable decisions, starting with climate action at the core, because we have seen that change is possible. This COVID-19 situation that we are facing has shown us that our leaders are capable of making rightful decisions if they really put climate change as a priority. So we have to remind them of what we are worth, of what Earth is worth. But we can't just remind them when we are seated. We need to stand up and make them aware and know that we need a just recovery. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Hilda. And I think you, I mean, you have highlighted the other side of the picture from Tamara, and it's absolutely part of the same struggle that we're all facing all around the world. And I think you've really illustrated some of the points that Tamara has highlighted there around the military industrial, the connections that are happening across 
the globe, uh, which are deliberately leaving people behind. It's not about leaving people behind. People are being pushed behind. And we need to turn that around so that the mechanisms that are out there in terms of new funding, which is being talked about, do actually lead to that systemic change that we're pushing for. So that's why this is the fight for our future and the fight for our lives, the fight for our money. So I'd, I'd like to turn next to another country which uh, has quite a, a large oil reserve, but is also facing some of these major inequality gaps. And we have a young activist from Nigeria to talk to us uh, about some of what's going on on the ground, how uh, organizations bringing together youth activists have been able to respond. Uh, so I'd like to hand over now to Abedin Olasupo. Oh, Abedin, over to you. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon. And uh, I'm quite excited to be joining you here this afternoon. I want to sincerely appreciate uh, Claudio, Linda, and others who have spoken well. I'm a from Nigeria. I'm a campaigner, climate activist, organizer, and as well as a strategist. Over time, the reason why the Millennium Development Goals really didn't work, especially in developing countries, was because we started very late. And that is why the organization I work with, Green Leaders with Development Initiative, is working on mobilizing campaigners across grassroots community in 774 local governments in Nigeria and 36 states of the federation to hold leaders accountable for the promises they did at the United Nations as it does the SDGs. Do you believe with me that goal 7 of the Sustainable Development Goals has to do with clean energy and goal 13 has to do with our climate action? Through collaboration with environmentalists and climate justice ambassadors in Nigeria, we are running a nationwide campaign to so have a representation of mindsets for young Nigerians, teach them on how to be climate activists and let them know why fossil fuels should stop. When the COVID 19 came in, through collaboration with over 136 young Nigerians who are climate activists, data wrangler, enumerator, content creator, graphic designer, we launched what we call No COVID 19. No COVID-19 was created to combat the issue of fake news because in Nigeria, we are tackling like green pandemic. The infodemic is there which has to do with the fake news. The issue of the pandemic is there which has to do with the coronavirus. And the issue of corruption damage is also another important factor because we have issues with um, transparency and accountability and young people trusting their leaders that they have appointed to take care of governance. So our organization so far has been able to perform over a hundred fake news through the no COVID-19 platform yeah. and through yeah. our matrix mapping as well. We are helping the government to flatten the curve by using matrix mapping to trace community contacts. Through the Brain Leaders International, we work on zero poverty, zero hunger, good health, quality education. But our core areas, our clean energy which is with seven. Reduce inequality, which is about 10, yeah? And peace and strong institution, which is about 16. Partnership for the goal 17, and then climate action, about 13. We have to start about the issue of fossil fuel because according to a start we carry out some years back, according to the World Health Organization, in 2013, 19,000 women in Nigeria died from the use of firewood. And in Nigeria, 70% of households are used by food, and that is an equivalent to like 1,722,000 of bottles of wood fuel, is equivalent to 1.5 million cars. So, if there's any country that are really need to want prayer, gather activists together to stop fossil fuel and talk about climate change, I think Nigeria is one of them. And that's the reason why our organization over the last four or five years have been working around that. As regards the issue of the economy, we are the new normal sincerely. It has affected a whole lot of sector. Young people who form majority of the population, if I need to be precise, 60% of the population in Nigeria, a whole lot of them have lost their jobs, a whole lot of them are depressed at the moment. And the owner of them does not really have a clear view of what exactly they want to do post COVID 19. So, our organization, 
two webinars and trainings that we organize bi weekly. We are treating topics like um, digital skills, topics like the economy. Precisely, we want to appreciate the Nigerian government. So I have purchased this year at a benchmark on oil. Nigeria depends solely on oil. Most of our revenue comes from oil. But unfortunately, the price of crude oil has shifted things. Our budget was premised on 57 GSC per barrel crude oil. Unfortunately, the crude oil is uh, around uh, 20, 25 US. So the Nigerian government is trying our best to ensure the uh, material alternatives to the SM. So, post COVID 19, we are trying to work together with other people who are in the COVID So, thank you very much for the privilege to be here. It's nice hearing feedback from you from another world, and I hope to connect with other um, participants here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Abidin. Uh, I'm sorry that we had a little bit of a slight uh, technical challenge there towards the end. We couldn't pick up everything we, you were saying, but uh, we'll certainly look at how we might promote your, uh, your views. Also in the follow-up uh, to this call, we'll make sure to make your ideas available if you want to send us through uh, a little clip as well that we can send out in addition. Um, so we have just a couple of ideas here for you um, because I know many of the people on this call will be wanting to take action yourselves. You're thinking about what you can do. Um, there's a whole, uh, there's actually a whole pack uh, that's going to be available on the website through 350. Uh, and this just gives you a bit of a flavor of some of the ideas that are out there. For example, given the, the, the rules at the moment around uh, face mask use, um, there's a strong suggestion to actually put uh, language on the face mask around just recovery messages. So you could make your own face mask, you can be creative, do it with your kids. I'm looking forward to having a go at making one and trying to bring some of those different messages to life so that when, if you're able to mobilize physically, uh, you're also doing that in a safe way. Um, there'll be, yeah, I think we've got a, a link in the chat there as well for the wider uh, the, the wider tools um, that are available as well. One, one last thing I would say, um, if you haven't had a chance to speak, and I know that these calls are often quite quick and, and we don't get to go to everyone, please feel free to put in the chat box where you're coming from, what your issues are, and we'll certainly look at how we can follow up because the idea, as I understand it, is we wanna make sure that we're telling as many of those stories as we can. Um, but now to, to close us off and to give us a, a fantastic uh, next step We'll, uh, I'd love to turn it over to the executive director of uh, 350. Uh, I hope I got the job title right. Uh, maybe, maybe not. May Bove, over to you, May. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, yes, you did. I, I'm May. I'm our executive director here at 350.org and so glad to be with you all and so inspired by all the other speakers, Tamara, Abedin, Hilda, Claudio, really a wonderful way to start the day because I'm calling from California. It's morning here, um, but I, you filled me with energy for the whole day. So thank you for that. And I, I, since the other speakers have really so beautifully described why we need to make this moment matter, what a just recovery is about, I'm really going to try to talk about the political opportunity and the strategy of all of us coming together right now and what might be possible if we did that. So you've, you've heard everyone talk about, we have to stand up and fight together. We have to intersect our struggles. We have to see them as one. So this, this is something that I think is really important about us joining this call today. We know as we're, as we're sitting here and listening to these inspiring words and organizing in our communities, we know that decisions are being taken right now as we speak about how the economy is going to change after COVID. And out of this enormous tragedy that is still unfolding and will for months and maybe even years to come, there is a parallel crisis about what it has done to so many people's jobs, livelihoods, and dignity. And there is an incredible moment at stake here because so many people have observed how the fundamentals of our economy are not serving us and how something like a global pandemic has 
exposed so deeply so many things that do not work about the way that our society is structured. And as Tamara said, that was structured that way intentionally. But so too, because of what we've seen, because of this shared experience of a global pandemic across all the countries where we live, that provides an opportunity for us to come together and imagine what could be different. And the beauty of this is that there are brilliant ideas about how the economy could work differently. I'm sure people on this call could tell you, here's the, here's the 10 step plan to change how transportation works around the world. Here's the 10 step plan to change how we structure debt. Here's the 10 step plan to change taxation. Here's the 10 step plan for the Green New Deal. We know what needs to be done. That has not ever really been the problem. The problem has been political will. And that is what is changing as people are coming together all over the world in this moment. And so the particular moment at hand that is bringing this particular call together is the G20 finance ministers meeting happening July 18th and 19th. There are going to be a lot of meetings over the course of the next few months and years that are going to be trying to figure out what economic recovery looks like. But this is a meeting that is fundamentally about how public resources are spent. This is the people's money that is at stake. These are the finance ministers of some of the richest countries in the world, and they are going to be thinking about how do they rebuild the economy. And because we are not going to be there, we have to be really creative about how do we insert our voices into that debate. We are not gonna get what we want out of this G20 meeting. We are not gonna get what we want out of the next few summits. We are going to have to keep pushing for a long time. But what we can do right now is we can set the terms of the debate that is taking place. We can make sure that we are asking for what is truly required to create that resilience that Hilda was talking about. To quote uh, Reverend William Barber here in the United States, he said, the biggest mistake we can make right now is not asking for enough. The whole economy is being rethought because it has been exposed as so vulnerable. So what can we do as activists to really imagine the future and speak up as one. So July 18th and 19th, July 18th and 19th is going to be an incredibly important moment for us to do that. But then we're going to need to keep doing it and we're going to need to be patient and we're going to need to be collaborative with each other. But I have incredible hope because of conversations like this about the connections that are being made across movements and all the ways people are mobilizing in their communities in ways that are safe even in the backdrop of this pandemic. So I hope you took down some notes from what Ollie was just saying about action steps that you can take. There's a global petition circulating about the G20. There are many ways you can contact your local elected officials and ask them to be adding their voice to this call. We're seeing mayors all over the world show a different kind of leadership and say, our city can build back better. What can we do as people of these cities to call for this to be improved? So there's lots of ways we can take action. And as I said, this is one moment among many, but I think our goal right now together is to really be clear about how important this moment is, that we are standing together as people all over the world, and that we see our struggles as connected. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, May. Uh, it uh, it's really is a, an amazing moment for us to, to be working together and for so many different uh, movements and coalitions to really be standing together to push for this crucial change. Um, we are almost out of time. Um, I'm just looking through the Q&A. I wanted to check if there were any final comments from some of our panelists who spoke earlier. If anyone has any any burning responses that they wanted to share? I don't know whether Tamara or Claudia, if there was anything you wanted to come back on just in the last couple of minutes. Hi, Oli. Uh, Claudio, do you hear me well? I was yeah. having a little bit of, uh, so I had to move uh, around. Yes, uh, just uh, two points and following what uh, I just heard is that uh, the economic recovery needs a just recovery. Uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is a good path, a good uh, guide for a just recovery. And 
it should be taken as such because we don't have to reinvent the wheel out of it. We just need to implement what has already been planned and thought out for so long. And the second point is the way to come to a new economic arrangement is we need to uh, not rebuild, but rearrange the financial architecture of the world. And as I said, it's from the financing process that things are either incentivized or and deployed or not. So we have to be a lot more in control of how finance is flowing around the world and how it's creating opportunities for uh, incentivizing things that are negatively affecting people and the planet. Those are the big two things. And I just put in the chat box, uh, the C20 policy pack is quite interesting because then we ask for some specifics. I'm just giving into broad strokes, but then there are some very specific measures that can be taken right away. Great, great, Claudio. And a really good reminder that so many of us did push for the sustainable development agenda, you know, back in 2015, and so many of those promises have not been kept. And now is the time, as you say, to put those key demands back on on the table. Um, I see there's been a question also around kind of disaster capitalism and how, uh, you know, there's a real risk that those who want to continue to exploit and rip the world's resources will use this as a moment for their agenda as well. Um, so I don't know um, whether this is something to put back to tomorrow. How can we make sure that doesn't happen tomorrow? Wow, we, uh, well, I can tell you one thing we're focused on is calling it out. Uh, we've been saying it since the very first uh, stimulus packages were coming out that we needed to move uh, for an oil bill out that serves people. The math is horrifying. Uh, in the US context, most Americans, if they jump through enough hoops beyond being alive, got a check for $12,000 while the average oil and gas man got $18,000 ahead. Like that's a huge, that's a, that's a horrifying coupon in any country in the world. So I just wanna flag that uh, we have no reason to trust that um, oily money will make the democracy work, that we should, that um, global structures will not be influenced by folks who are happy to let the planet burn while they keep their interests going. And it is our job as activists, organizers, strategists, and human beings to uh, hold up scrutiny for every single one of these proposals, push for more than what we're being asked for, uh, demand that all of that same money be moved directly into communities. Um, we are in a moment where every single dollar equates to access and power and the right to survive another day to have the conversation. So at every moment where we can call the question, uh, where is the money going? It is the people's money. There are no giant piles of money that came from private industry. So uh, yeah, we shouldn't trust them. We should inspect them. We need to be loud and do it together. Amazing, thanks Tamara. I, I, uh, you, you really do kind of capture it so well. Um, I don't think there's much we can add to that, but it, it is a, a structural challenge that we're facing. And I think we, we really do have to work together at this time. And as so many people have been commenting on the chat as well, um, highlighting where those, those moments of change can be and how we can make sure that we use this, this window of opportunity to really push for a different vision. Um, so just a, a final couple of points, I think, would be to remind people that most of the resources that we've talked about in terms of campaigning materials are available through the 350 dedicated page on the website. Uh, yep, thank you. There we go. We have it on the screen now. So you can find whatever you need there. Please do let us know uh, which country you're working in. If we can help you to connect with other networks within your country, we're, we're very keen to help that. And where possible, share it as much as you can through social media so we can really amplify those messages. We can make sure they cut through in the, uh, the media kind of storm that will, that will likely happen over the coming uh, weeks. Um, we really want to make sure that this message does cut through and that it doesn't just become business as usual. This is the moment to demand that this is our money, this is our future, this is our lives at stake. Uh, so please do, do share the message as widely as you can. Uh, 
uh, and we'll be looking forward to following up uh, with you over, over the next few weeks. Um, I don't know if there's anything more from May or from anyone else at 3.50 before we close. Nothing for me. Yeah, thank you. That was a lovely closing, Ollie. Well, thank you guys. And thank you to everyone who's been part of the call and everyone who's joined to listen in. And we look forward to carrying on working together. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you, everyone. Pleased to meet you, May, and Tamara. You too. You too. Until we meet again. Yes. <laughs>